It's going to be in Daniel chapter 4. Remind us that by the time we get into this period of history, there are actually documents that can be cross-referenced as far as what scriptures say and what we have historically from some of these communities. When they dug up um, uh, the Assyrian capital at Nineveh, vast numbers of documents that, that they could actually take a look at. Same thing is true of Babylon. And so we know a, a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar outside of Scripture. He kept records of himself uh, and his the kings that followed after him. So we know a little bit about Babylonian uh, society and about his kingdom. That's encouraging in some ways and discouraging in some ways because when people try to cross-reference and they don't find accounts that we find in Scripture, then they say, oh, well, they made that up. That's, that's just ancient Jews telling stories. That's not anything real. So we'll look a little bit at that as we go through uh, tonight. But Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. And, of course, since he has already had a, an occasion to have Daniel give him an interpretation for a, da a dream, he calls him in and uses him as a helper in figuring this thing out. The difference is this time he gives the dream and only asks for the interpretation. And he doesn't threaten to chop anybody up in little pieces if they can't give him the interpretation. So we'll go kind of slowly through four and look at the dream. It is a dream that... Um, kind of falls into to line with what Jesse just led, you know, is your heart right with God? Nebuchadnezzar knew who God was. There are times in his life that he praises him, calls him the most high God, but then he turns back around and makes this giant statue of Marduk and worships that. And here he has to be reminded who put him in the position where he is, who is giving him the power that he has, those kind of things. He needs to be reminded. Um, so chapter 1, verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Is all of that true? Yes. Is all of that scripture? Yes. Who wrote it? The bad guy wrote this, right? You've got the, the king of a nation that God has used to uh, punish his people, Judah. He's gone in. He's wiped out the temple. He's carried people off hostage. When you get to the New Testament, if you want to have a name for the bad guys... What do you call them? Babylon, right? So Babylon, you get in, think about over in uh, the Revelation, right? The bad guys in Revelation are referred to as Babylon the Great, the great harlot of Babylon. So this is, this is the leader of a nation that is known as one of the real persecutors, one of the real bad guys. And yet, in the middle of Daniel... Well, not in the middle, but in Daniel, in Scripture, we have this guy writing praise uh, poetry, praise uh, lyrics about our God. Is it true? Yeah. Is it Scripture? Yeah. It's in there for our perusal. It's in there for our learning, for our edification. But it's odd where sometimes Scripture comes uh, to us. You remember when we were in the writings of Solomon, and Solomon borrowed some literature from the mother of a king of another nation. Right? This is These are the sayings of the mother of King Lemuel. And so he, he puts them in. Is it scripture? Well, yeah. It's the Holy Spirit has in here what the Holy Spirit wants in here. It's just odd sometimes where the uh, who the human authors end up being. All right, verse 4. 
I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods, plural, is in him. So we started out with a praise note about the Most High God and the things that he had done for Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, this is written in retrospect. He's looking back. But then he says, I needed to have Daniel, who's also known as Belteshazzar. He's named after my God. Who's his God? Well, the main God is Marduk. But evidently, as time went by, Marduk was simply referred to as the Lord, very similar to what you and I do, right? Sometimes we say God, sometimes we say the Lord, sometimes we say Jesus, sometimes we say the Lord. Evidently, they got in the practice of saying Marduk, but they might also say, oh, well, the Lord, meaning Marduk. So Bel is the ancient word for Lord. So Belt Teshazar, Shazar, means uh, protect or take care of the king. So it's a little bit like God saved the king, but the God was kind of, we're not exactly sure who it is, but maybe it is the God Marduk referred to as Bel. So put that in the back of your mind and find a good occasion to ask somebody, you know, if, if you don't have all the trivia, what are you going to do? So he, and, uh, he said, uh, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, so he gives him the title that, again, we wouldn't necessarily want any of our ministers to have. Uh, here's Jay. He's the chief of our magicians. That's not, you know, we're not going to stand for that. Uh, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, again, plural, and no mystery is too difficult for you. So here's my dream. Here's my dream. Interpret it for me. So he brings in Daniel to give him the answer to the question. Again, very reminiscent of Joseph in Egypt. Uh, the first time that Pharaoh calls for Joseph, the guy that Joseph had told his, answered his dream, interpreted his dream in prison, was back working for him, right? The guy that uh, was the cupbearer. And so he hears Pharaoh saying, well, I'm having these dreams and it terrifies me. And he says, oh yeah, I remember now. There was this guy in the prison and he can interpret dreams. So it's, it's something that God used throughout the centuries as a way to help guide the affairs of these kings that he was using in different ways. This is the vision that I saw while I was lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. You remember how big the statue was that he saw? It was enormous, reached up to the heavens. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for everybody. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches, and from it, every creature was fed. Sounds a little bit like the first vision in some ways, that there, you know, the, the giant head of gold and then the torso of silver. It's a big, beautiful, magnificent thing that's there that he's seeing. Uh, while I was lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. Anybody have a watchman? The watchman. Um, not sure. Maybe it's a little easier for people not to get... King James says watcher. Watcher. A watcher. Um, not to get carried away by not putting watchman in here, but it's been kind of a standard translation for a lot of years. Uh, there are questions about who are the watchers, who are the watchmen. So I'll, I'll give you a little background as to what, what we know about the idea of the watchman anyway. Uh, there's a writer that's probably spurious. Uh, is, the book is called Enoch the book of Enoch, and he's the one that gives us way too much information about Genesis 6. 
the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took for took from among them for wives, and they had children, and that's when the Nephilim, the mighty men of renown, were on the land. Um, Enoch says that that was the watchman, that their job was to watch human beings. Some sources say their job was to watch the leadership of human beings. So that would make sense as far as Nebuchadnezzar is concerned. He's one of the most prominent kings on the planet at the time. A watchman shows up and has a conversation with him. Think about Job 1. Uh, it says that God was uh, there and the sons of God came to be with God. And they're giving reports. And he asked uh, Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? Satan says, yeah, I know about him. And, and then they have this conversation about how to handle Job and his situation. So anyway, that's the kind of thinking that's behind that translation, watchman, that some kind of angels that were in charge of keeping an eye on things. Uh, this is the same group that is said to be housed in Tartarus waiting for judgment, that they overstepped their bounds, did things they weren't supposed to do, and that God is now keeping them in chains until time for judgment. Uh, some ancient sources say he keeps them in the valleys, in the depths of the valleys. So I'm not saying any of that is God's honest truth. I'm just saying that's what these guys thought. Okay, so that's the, the, the thinking around the idea of watchmen uh, grew out of these kind of episodes. So when Nebuchadnezzar sees a watcher, a holy one, somebody from the heavens, again, you have to ask the question, why aren't you worshiping the one true God if you know about what a watchman is or you know about who angels are? Why does, how does that elude you? All right, 14. The, the watchman cries out in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds uh, from its branches, but let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times have passed by him. Uh, probably the best understanding is seven years. Uh, there's a lot of sevens in Daniel. And as we get toward the end of Daniel's prophecy, we'll run into a lot of sevens. Those sevens are not necessarily just years. They're epics of time. So anyway. uh, the decision is announced by messengers the holy ones, again, the watchers, uh, declare the verdict so that the living one, or so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. So Nebuchadnezzar, you're all proud of yourself and how, thing, how well things are going. God wants you to know that you're, you're nothing. He's using you. He's got you where he needs you to be, and you need to play by his rules, not expect him to play by yours. This is the dream that I, Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. If you knew that, why did you ask everybody else? Nebuchadnezzar just, he makes me mad. Uh, I want him to do well. I, I hate that about it too. I, I kind of like Nebuchadnezzar because he's kind of in and out, in and out, but he never seems to figure it out completely. He's so immersed in his own culture and so full of his own uh, ego that things that seem obvious, reading them in the text, seem to get by him. All right, verse 19. Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, uh, was greatly perplexed for a time. His thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. You remember when Samuel uh, is first called by God. Samuel, you know, and he thinks it's Eli calling him. He runs to Eli's room. and Eli finally tells him, if the voice calls you again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. 
when he says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, what does God tell him? Lots of good news? No. no. Terrible news. Horrible news. When Eli talks to him in the morning and says, well, you know, how'd your visit go with whoever was calling you last night? And Samuel didn't want to tell him, and Eli says, may the, may the Lord God do to you and even more if you don't tell me every word he told you. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is saying to Daniel. You know, don't, don't chicken out. Tell me what the vision was. Don't let this all bother you. Don't let it bring you down. Tell me what God has told you. So Belteshazzar answered, My Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Uh, if you're Nebuchadnezzar, you dream a lot of dreams about yourself. You notice that? Every time he calls for Daniel, Daniel, what's the dream about? Well, king, the dream's about you. And so far, that's pretty good news, right? You're the head of gold, and there will be kingdoms that will come after you, but they won't be as good as your kingdom. You're the best kingdom ever. And then, you know, you're the, you're the great tree, and people can see you from everywhere, and you've got fruit for everybody. You provide for all your people. You're tremendous, but, <laughs> and then he has to tell him, what, it, what the rest of the vision means or what the watcher meant when he told him. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the field, in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass for him. This is the interpretation. Your majesty, this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. This letter, perhaps, is the answer to that challenge. Right? You're going to be seven times is going to pass over you until you admit who the one true God is. So in the very beginning when he says, you know, let me praise God for you. Let me tell you who the one true God really is. It may be his opportunity to finally give a confession that God is the one who took him through all of this. So if you look in retrospect that he's writing this after all these things happened, then it might make sense that he said all of those things, but still doesn't seem to have it figured out. Uh, where did I stop? 26. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. It's very similar to the uh, prophecies against Israel and against Judah. And you've got all of those chapters of bad things are coming, and then that last chapter, right? The, the you've still got hope chapter is sometimes couched as the root will, will sprout again. When David's family line is kind of subjugated by other kings and whatever the prophecy is, there will a root of the family of Jesse, a root from David will come forth and the kingdom will be restored, right? Meaning Jesus. So this idea that if you just leave the stump in the ground, that eventually it'll regrow. And so he applies this in this passage to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. So Daniel says, maybe God would change his mind and maybe... You know, if you weren't so full of yourself, maybe you wouldn't have these problems. Verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, 
as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? That's a bad way to, to go. But it's been a year, right? He's, he had that dream a year ago. It's kind of like when we go on a diet and we're doing really good at first and then we forget that we're on a diet. I think that Nebuchadnezzar forgot that he was on a diet of egotism. Uh, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what I decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority is taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. What did it say the last time? He gives them to unimportant people, right? This time it says he gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and he ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. So perhaps for seven years, this is what's going on with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he has an offspring, don't know if it's his son or grandson, uh, in the, the lineage named Belshazzar, very similar to Daniel's name. Some people think they're the same name. The spellings just got uh, mixed up. Who seems to be stepping in and taking over the reins of leadership, but he's never actually the king of Babylon. So it's possible that during this time frame, Belshazzar is taking over the reins. Uh, but again, there's no historical writings from that time frame about, Belsh about uh, Nebuchadnezzar having to go out and live in the open for seven years. Uh, one of the best comments I think was made was, uh, if you are Nebuchadnezzar and you're writing all the, the great things that you did, do you put this in? No. Same argument is made when you read the ancient writings of the uh, Egyptian pharaohs. Why isn't there a pharaoh that says, and then my kid died, and I let him go, and, they, and we chased him, but all my soldiers died in the sea? It doesn't look good on your resume. So the, the things that they wrote about themselves and all these stila and, and things they left behind don't always mention the bad parts of their uh, kingships. But anyway, Nebuchadnezzar uh, in Scripture says, this is what happened to me. And at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Did he have an opportunity to repent earlier? Yes. Was God saying you're going to have seven seasons or seven years, period? Or was he saying if you don't repent, it'll be seven. It seems like he's saying it's going to be seven no matter what you do, and at the end of seven, then you can repent. And he does, but again, how much did he know? How much was he capable of reasoning about his own situation and why he was there and did he need to repent? All those kinds of things. He evidently was living like an animal during those times, but when he finally looked up to heaven, uh, his sanity was restored then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified the one who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Who gets to tell God what to do? Nobody. And so at least at this point in his life, while he's writing this account, Nebuchadnezzar knows that that's true. How long that lasted until he went back off the diet and started filling himself up with egotism again, I do not know. Verse 36, at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven <clears throat> because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Those who walk in pride, 
he is able to humble. So he knows firsthand. Uh, I found another little snippet. It's not from Scripture. But a another king of Babylon later on named Nabonidus. You ever heard that name? Pronounced that poorly? Okay. Nabonidus uh, wrote in his, uh, some of his writings about a similar situation that he had. Words of the prayer which Nabonidus, king of the land of Babylon, the great king, prayed when he was afflicted by a malignant inflammation by decrees of the God Most High in Telmon. I, Nabonidus, was afflicted by a malignant inflammation uh, for seven years and was banished far from men until I prayed to the God Most High. An exorcist forgave me my sin. He was a Jew from the exiles, and he said to me, Make a proclamation in writing so that the glory, exaltation, and honor can be given to the name of the God Most High. And I wrote as follows. When I was afflicted by a malignant inflammation, I, Timon, the decree of the God Most High, prayed for seven years to all the gods of silver and gold, of bronze and iron, of wood, of stone, and of clay, because I thought that they were gods. So that's, that's what they have translated from him. So perhaps we don't have in Scripture that it happened again, that God was working among the Babylonians and saying, look, you're going to know that I'm in charge. And if it takes making you sick or making you crazy to get your attention, then that's the way we'll do it. So Nebuchadnezzar learns his lesson and we have the his own account of the things that happened to him. And then evidently Nabonidus had similar problems later on in the kingdom and was able to get God to act on his behalf as well. Does it bother you at all that our God, who is you know, fighting our battles for us, who leads the uh, Israelites into Canaan, wipes out a civilization so he can plant his people in there, does it bother you at all that he's nice to the bad guys? He's sovereign. This is what Nebuchadnezzar wants us to know. God gets to choose. He was using the Babylonians. He was using Nebuchadnezzar. He made Nebuchadnezzar as big and as important as he was. The great statue of, with the golden head, God made him the golden head. The great tree, God planted him. God made him the big tree. The problem wasn't with what God was doing with Nebuchadnezzar. The problem was what Nebuchadnezzar was doing with Nebuchadnezzar. He was getting more and more excited about how great he was and turning aside from the one that gave him all those things. Now that'll preach because every last one of us has been given things by God and we've got the choices to whether we want to put the praise on ourselves, look how good I am, look at the neat things I can do, or do we want to say, God keeps blessing me. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the God most high. 